to others. Now the scripture teaches that before salvation our whole way of life is driven by lust for sins, sins both of the flesh and of the mind. And while some of those sins are horrid and shameful, they're obvious for everybody to see. On the other hand, most of them are so subtle that we may never even be aware of them ourselves, being intimately interwoven, the threads of indwelling sin really that make up the garments of our consciousness. And so, as Ephesians 2 and verse 3 tells us, being by nature just inherently what we are the children of wrath that means children appointed to the day of wrath the frightening description of the unsaved and in that situation we are led according to this passage irresistibly by sin to the slaughter as the sons and daughters of Adam. And so the scripture conceives of sin as a power, as it does in Romans 6 and verse 2. A cruel master that exercises absolute power over his subjects. You have no power to resist outside of Christ. Just as we saw in this morning's illustration of the black hole, you cannot resist that kind of power. Come back with me to Romans chapter 6 and verse 2. <clears throat> I want us to reread and reread this aloud together, please. Ready? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, the passage speaks about our being dead to sin as a ruling power. But exactly what does it mean to be dead to it? Now, with this question, we are thrown into an issue which historically has been very fertile ground for erroneous views of sanctification. And the way we answer this question, in fact, is critical to our whole understanding of the rest of chapter 6. Some believe that we are dead to sin in the sense that we are to take this statement as a command. That is to say that we are commanded to renounce sin, just to set ourselves firmly against it, make up our minds to have nothing to do with it. That is called the renunciation view. Well, the New Testament does often tell us that we're to have nothing to do with sin. It tells us to renounce sin. Yes, it does do that, but really the context here does not support that kind of interpretation. Other believers believe that it is speaking about the increasing levels of holiness that we would call sanctification. They see that our progressive victory over sin is in view here. And this is called the progressive view, it's simply referring to our sanctification, which we know is a process. But really, this hardly fits the description of us being dead to sin, does it? I mean, death is a pretty final thing, isn't it? It's hard for us to actually equate that with a progressive process like sanctification. But perhaps the most serious error regarding the meaning of dead to sin is the view that this is an exhortation to be perfectly sinless. Have you heard of the doctrine of sinless perfection? That is built on this verse. How anybody could come to that understanding, if you read the whole of Romans 6, 7 and 8 in context, is really it defies reasonable thinking. And yet that's precisely what many have done. 
They lock right in on those words of the Apostle Paul about being dead to sin and they refuse to hear anything else. They refuse even to give a fair examination of the context in which the statement was made. And in holding to a doctrine like this, the doctrine of sinless perfection, then people need to do a couple of things at least that I can think of. Probably there are more. But the obvious thing they need to do is they need to totally ignore some very plain scriptures to the contrary. I won't go into those tonight, and you're probably aware of those already. The second thing they need to do is they need to hold to a very weakened and unbiblical definition of sin. If they're going to come out and fool themselves that they are indeed sinlessly perfect, then that's what they have to do. They have to lower the bar. They have to redefine what sin actually is. Really kid themselves and actually turn a deaf ear to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which is a serious thing. Beyond that, it sets people up for one of two great dangers. Usually, great discouragement because most people who start to head down that track discover pretty quick smart that that is an inattainable standard and they come to the conclusion often that they are not saved tragic. Less often the case, but still this is the other option, people will come to the place where in very sinful pride they have a self-deluded counterfeit holiness. When I first came to Tamworth about 13 years ago, I remember meeting with a man had quite a spiritual bearing about him. He was a man that had quite presence too. He was a man in his mid-50s. I was probably at that stage in my early 30s. It turned out that this man had a background in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. He was a TAFE lecturer, well known in town. It was obvious that he had a great deal of Bible knowledge but he proceeded to tell me that there were times when he experienced sinless perfection, days and even weeks when he experienced sinless perfection. Needless to say, at that point, we had a sharp disagreement. (laughs) On another occasion, many years ago, even before that, we were given a book by a friend of ours entitled Unto Perfection. It was a book that was given to us by one of our evangelical friends, just one of the many heretical books which you can probably get a hold of quite easily. One who was in fellowship within the circles, which we then fellowshiped in. And this single young man gave it to us really quite innocently. He was a very serious-minded man, had a lot of influence with young people and even with older people. But he was apparently oblivious to the seriousness of the error that he was propagating. So the doctrine of sinless perfection was also something really that the Salvation Army used to promote in their pursuit of holiness. They've come a long way now. They've swung the other way, haven't they? But there was a time when they actually promoted holiness, a counterfeit form of holiness, in fact. Mark Minnick relays the story of the well-known Bible commentator Harry Ironside, who in his teen years was almost destroyed by a frustrating search for holiness while he was attending the Salvation Army Church where they were teaching the doctrine of sinless perfection. Fortunately for him, he identified the counterfeit holiness fairly early in life and he parted company with the Sallies. But years later, you know, he went on to write a book that I have on my shelf at home called Holiness, the False and the True. It was a great discovery that he'd made. He wanted to let other people be warned about this thing. And there's another well-known author whose materials are circulated in our own circles as fundamentalists. Many homeschooling families subscribe to his literature. 
What Michael Pearl has to say about the family in his No Greater Joy magazine is often very good, very solid, even very biblical. But he also unashamedly propagates his brand of sinless perfectionism. There's a whole series on the book of Romans. And he bases it on texts like this one. Romans 6 verse 2. It was David Cloud who exposed that not so long ago in one of his magazines. So these are the errors which have been built upon this particular verse, errors which still abound today. And what we have to realise is that in a climate like today's where we have so much capability of just reaching into the internet, reaching into the bookstore, it's so attractive in this generation that wants everything immediately to just latch on to an immediate method of attaining Christ-likeness. It's so convenient, so tempting. And the ground was probably never more fertile than today for building heresies that purport to be an easy road to sanctification. Or else the other option is simply letting the bar right down altogether. There is no such thing as a holy life. You just basically live like the world so you can reach the world. And that, is, that is very important for us to realise as we're considering just how we are to become more like the Master so that we're not tempted to pursue one of those easy shortcut routes that cheat us. Well, what do we understand then as the correct understanding of this verse? I'm very glad you asked me that question. <laughs> First, I'd like to do a little exercise with you. We've already seen that the word sin dominates this chap chapter over 17 times in all. Could somebody get me a glass of water, please? Underneath the book of that, it's hiding. Right. <clears throat> The theme of death, as well as sin, also features in this chapter. In fact, death is mentioned in every one of the first ten verses in Romans 6, except for the first verse. Now, every time it occurs, it refers either to Christ or it refers to the believer. Now, I want us to go through and mark each one of these verses, either with a capital B if it refers to the believer, if you've got your, your pens with you and if you want to mark your Bibles, or a, a capital C for Christ, depending on whether it's speaking about the death of the believer or the, de the death of Christ. If you haven't got your Bible or you don't want to mark your Bibles, then you can just listen with me. But I do have my Bible marked with these letters beside these verses. Okay, I said the first verse doesn't have a reference to death, but the second verse does. And this is the verse which we are expositing tonight. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Okay, anybody tell me what does that refer to, with a death there? Does it refer to us or does it refer to Christ? Somebody brave. Us, exactly. Who said that? Go to the top of the class, Tim Cole. It refers to the believer. That's right. Okay, the next one. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Okay. Who's, what is this? Not you, Tim Cole. It's, it's got to be somebody else. Christ, okay. But are we sure about that? Nah, it's a little bit dicey, this one, isn't it? Because we are also in there, aren't we? We were baptized with him into his death. 
So there's really both there. There's a B and a C there. Verse 4, 